Hey everybody, it's Peter again. And look at all this stuff I got. So today I wanted to do a video on getting these cabinets prepped, sanded and prepped, ready for finishing. And that could be a lot of different things. Uh, eventually I'll do a, a video on uh, finishing these and, and maybe those too. So these are the red oak ones that were in the monster long, way too long video. And those were the cabinets that were in the shorter but still too long video. So I'm gonna really try and condense these videos or break them up somehow. It's just that that one got kind of out of hand. So a couple of things I wanted to address uh, here. There was a question on YouTube about orientation of the sides of the cabinet. This is assuming that you're putting together the, the cabinet that I provide. And anyway, so this, logo it always goes at the top by the tweeter so it, it's actually located right there and right there there's a right and a left orientation to that these slots will locate the braces and the, the whole intent there is so you don't have to worry about if you watch the original assembly video I was using a, a measured stick to get this spacing right and this spacing right and this spacing right. This takes all that out of the equation. So there's some parts of that that are no longer relevant. So Nova logo goes up top. So that means that's gonna be oriented just like that. So the other question that came up was the amount of glue in the way of, uh, in the instructions on heat lock. And I went back and looked and they do say you may need to use two coats and I gauge that by the sheen on it both when it's wet and when it's dry and also the amount of glue that I'm putting on when I apply it with a roller. What I'd say there is when you're putting that glue on you don't want it dripping all over the place but you also want to get on probably as thick a coat as you can reasonably do and make it look even. It's not like painting where you're gonna try and roll it out and get a lot of distance out of it. You're better off to assume you're gonna use a little bit more glue and get by with one coat. It also depends on what you're putting on. This MDF, because it's so dense, the surface layer is not all that absorptive. But if you were using something like plywood, something that absorbed a lot of glue, I would say, Roll it on, let it dry. If the sheen is uneven or it looks like it's patchy in terms of coverage, put a second coat on. Um, better to do that than find out you don't have enough glue on when it, goes, when it comes time to actually apply the veneer. So enough about that. Oh, and look at this thing. I forgot to show this. <laughs> look at this whopper lure. So I have kind of a penchant for odd things and I found this at an auction and uh, I have a friend who says that the bigger uh, bait you use when you fish the bigger fish you'll catch so I don't know how many of you are fishermen out there but uh, you might <laughs> makes me wonder what kind of fish I'd catch with that so anyway kind of a, a fun thing and um, so material I'm gonna use. Oh, one other thing I wanna cover. Uh, the, there, it came kind of into my line of sight. Now before, I think I might have told you in, the, in the, uh, the veneering video, I would have cut these holes prior to, or, or, or I should say after I veneered them. And with, with CNC and doing these kits that are sort of pre-cut for people, there's something that crossed my mind that maybe I should bring up and see what what people would like to have and that is the depth that this tweeter sinks into the cabinet and because it's pre-cut when I go to when I set this programming up and I can I can set the router to to cut that whatever depth I like I cut it and deep enough so that if someone were painting you'd have a really thin coating and this edge of the tweeter would line up with the edge of the cabinet. Now when I apply veneer I'm actually applying about 25-30 thousandths worth of depth because of the thickness of the veneer. 
So that has the effect of sinking the tweeter down into the cabinet a little bit. This is all hair splitting, but ideally you would not, which you know by now that I split hairs. That's what I do. So ideally you wouldn't want a sharp edge there. You could ease that edge a little bit with some sandpaper. You want to be sure and not put some, some uh, cross grain sanding scratches in there. Or you could cut essentially a spacer that would go in here. And the ideal thing to use would be the veneer because that's exactly the depth that you're deepening this rabbit by is the thickness of the veneer. So you just take, there's a gasket on the back of this, which is actually not on there right now. In fact, let me grab it. So that's the gasket that's on the back side of the tweeter. And I think there's a couple dabs of glue on there, but you could just cut this with a razor knife. It doesn't have to be pretty and make a spacer to raise that up. There is another possibility, and that is I could conceivably, I'm, I'm a little reticent to change things midstream, but if there was enough call for cabinets that people knew they were gonna veneer, I could actually change the depth of this. It would cause one more problem, or I shouldn't say one more problem, but it would cause a choice to be made in terms of do you want your face cut for veneer or not? And I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm reticent to do that because it adds one more element that people need to make a decision about far before they're actually going to assemble this. And it also increases inventory for me because I'm gonna to have to have veneer fronts and non-veneer fronts. So if you're watching this and, and you have a preference, you think it would be worthwhile to do that, uh, let me know and I'll, if I get enough people saying that they would rather have it that way, then I'll, I'll look at doing that. Uh, and, and bear in mind that it's, it's not, if, if you plan on making one of these out of an ear you're using, it accomplishes the same thing. It just gets the tweeter edge flush with the front of the cabinet. And that, it, for the same reason I bevel the back of the woofer hole, you don't want a sharp edge there as the sound radiates out of this tweeter. You don't want it uh, hitting something kind of abrupt there. So anyway, I might've gone on too long about that, uh, but it, it can be addressed in a couple different ways. Let me know what you think might be appropriate. Other things I'm gonna use in the video, this is a 150 grit belt and, and doesn't have to be a belt. I use belts because they're, they're around and, and they're easy to make sanding blocks out of. Uh, oh, and I should back up a little bit. Uh, I am going to do kind of two halves to the sanding video. I'm gonna do one where I hand sand it because I really don't know what kind of equipment a lot of the people who are watching this have. Maybe you're accomplished woodworkers Maybe you're beginners, maybe you've never touched anything woodworking in your life. So I figure if I cover both bases, so this would be the kind of rudimentary way to sand the cabinet. And then the other way that I'll show is, uh, this is a pneumatic sander. These are made by Dynabray. I have several of them around. And uh, it has a Velcro pad on it and also dust collection system, which this port right here is for dust collection. And there is one other thing I'll talk about there, and that is the, the sanding paper I use is actually a sanding screen. I don't know how clear that comes out, but you can probably see my hand waving behind that. So this is actually a mesh, a stiff mesh fabric that has the abrasive on it. And so no matter how I orient that, it's pulling through those holes. And I still have a lot of the sandpaper left over that has holes in it and you always have to be careful to align those holes to make sure that you're getting suction through the sandpaper right onto the surface. And this product is made by Merca. There might be other manufacturers. I, uh, Merca has long been in the abrasive business and this particular product is called AutoNet. And I'll show a, a photo of that and I should probably cover that a little bit. Anytime I put products out there that people might not be familiar with, I will link them to the manufacturer's site in most cases 
and uh, also show a photo at the end of the video so you can kind of get an idea when you're looking at them. And you'll see in the background there, that thing is all full of sandpaper or different grits. So I'm, I'm really, once I found this stuff, I really got on board. It's it just really easy to use, lasts a long time, kind of spendy if you're only gonna use a sheet or two. So if, if that's the case, I would recommend probably not. But for those of you, again, I, I don't know who my audience is exactly. And, and so this might seem way out of the scope of what you're gonna do, or maybe it's right on target. You can let me know. File, you've seen me talk about that before, and I'll show you how I do that here. A little bit of masking tape, I'll show you where I use that. And uh, so sanding sponges. This is a sanding sponge I found made by 3M. I get these at a, a paint store, and uh, I really like these. They have really crisp edges. They're pretty stiff, too. As sanding sponges go, some of them are a lot more compliant. And I found that I really like these uh, 3M product. And just out of curiosity, because I thought it might be easier, I was in Home Depot one day and I found, uh, if it's not the same product, it's really similar. The color is slightly different, but again, made by 3M and uh, the size is slightly different, but these are nice sanding sponges. I like them a lot, unless I'm trying to follow a contour, in which case the softer ones actually work better. So uh, the pick, you've seen that before, and I'm gonna show you how I locate those holes there. So, because we veneered over the holes that came in the cabinet, and I think um, that covers everything. I've got a cheat sheet right here um, that I wanted to cover, and uh, I'll, I'll save the rest of the stuff as we, as we get to it. And you know, one other thing that maybe I wanted to talk about, this, this will mean nothing to some people and something to others. Files get dull. Uh, and there's a lot of videos and talk about how to sharpen files by dunking them in everything from acid to vinegar to Coca-Cola to you name it. And here is my thought on that. You're never going to get this sharp by eroding the material it's made out of. That's machined in there when this file was made. And if it gets full of junk, you might clean it, but once it's dull, I think the best place for these is in the garbage can. Um, dull files are like dull blades on hand planes or, or uh, table saw or any kind of dull cutter. So I replace these from time to time. I'll go through, um, Oh, when I was using them a lot, I would go through two or three a year. So for whatever it's worth to you, file sharpening, I think, is a, a really widespread farce. And for what it takes to purchase one, I just don't see it as being a worthwhile thing. So I'm going to kind of clean up my space here, get ready, and, and we'll go on to some actual stuff being done, and that's sanding these. So back in a few. Alrighty, we're back and, or maybe I'm back. I guess you're back too if, if you're watching this. So uh, uh, first thing I wanted to talk about was the holes. Now you'll see there I've already located those woofer holes that we covered up with veneer and that is ready to finish. Now this is actually sanded to 220 grit. Which, which, by the way, uh, anything beyond that in the raw wood, I, I think is kind of a waste of time. Um, the, uh, e even I've finished an awful lot of cabinet sanding to 180, and the, the finish you achieve is done in the finish itself. Uh, a lot of what people try and achieve before the fact when you put stain and stuff on this, it's, it's going to raise grain a little bit. And when you put clear on it, it's going to raise grain. So the time to smooth things out is during the finishing stage. Now, I'm not suggesting that you don't sand, but uh, to go up to 380 or 400 or 600 grit on raw wood, it just 
doesn't take you any place I think that you really need to go for a project like this. Now there are places where it's appropriate, but I'll kind of leave that at that. So this obviously the holes are covered up with veneer and that's where that little pit comes in. Anything that'll fit inside that hole will work to do this. This has got a sharpened end on it and the diameter is less than an eighth of an inch in the three quarters of an inch depth that that needs to go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick this in the cabin. I'm gonna find that hole. I'm gonna find, I really only need to find two holes because the, the woofer itself will actually locate the other one. So I'm just pushing that through and I don't know if that was very obvious from the canvas, but I, I'm kind of twisting that through and that lets me know that that hole is right there you know what else might work for this? I never thought of it until now is uh, an ice pick, a skinny ice pick. So I'm just pushing that in a hole and the, the way these woofers mount, they actually cover up a lot of that. So I'm not really concerned. What you wouldn't want to do is to push up a big flake of veneer. Hopefully this is glued well enough to where you, that would actually be pretty hard to do. So I'll find the other one. A lot of this is by feel kind of hard to see inside there. Let me tell you how easy it is and then I have trouble. Huh? So ideally you'd find two holes that were opposite. Now I'm gonna move that a little closer. I'm just taking that pick in my hand and, and spinning it and pushing it through. So that gives me two holes that I know are in the right spot. And I, um, bear with me here. You've seen me use this thing, or at least I showed it to you before. That's a countersink. And I actually want to countersink the holes around because the minute I put a screw in them, it's especially when you're working with veneer, it really wants to pull that veneer off and Ideally, you, you wouldn't do that. You don't have a lot of thickness with veneer to deal with, so it requires a little bit of finesse that you're not messing up the work you've already done. So I'm countersinking those, and that one eighth inch, and by the way, those holes are eighth inch, so you're gonna be using an eighth inch drill bit to uh, drill them through and, and also uh, as, as you drill them out this way. Uh, much bigger than eighth of an inch and you're gonna get into a situation where your screws won't thread in correctly. So I'll tip that down so you can see them. My total diameter of the countersink there is something less than a quarter, I would say. I don't know if it shows up any better there. And then you can take the driver and the holes are all evenly spaced on the driver so you know this is gonna work without giving a second thought and locate those. And these might have already been threaded. I honestly don't remember, but at this point, uh, again, I'm one to pre-fit and pre-drill and pre-assemble just to make sure I don't run into hitches. So it's a really good likelihood that I, I already ran screws in these holes. So I'm gonna get those down, not necessarily tight, so that driver can move around a little bit, but this should locate all the rest of the holes. So I'm gonna take that pick again, and I'm just gonna probe around, and that just went right into the hole. And you've only got this, I would say, about two, maybe 3 16 under a quarter inch hole there. So you'll, you'll find it pretty fast. So those are, I'm just pushing those into the holes, I'm kind of probing around with that. Maybe I can put that up there a little bit. So all I'm doing, let me see if I can do this so you can see it, is pushing that in and it just goes right in. Uh, with a tapered point like that, it's, it's gonna find it and it's gonna slide around. And it doesn't really matter if it's dead center because it will, it will find the center as you do that. So there are all the holes located. And you can take the driver back out. 
Danny sends the Torx head screws with his kits and they work out really nice because it's really hard to do what's called a cam out. Uh, you want to be a little careful if you're using a power driver like I am here that you don't slide off and people have put holes in drivers before and I've come close uh, by, by slipping and if you're if you're not confident in that, I mean, I use battery drills all the time, but you could just do it by hand. So now I've got all the, the holes located. And because this thing just happens to be the right size, I'm just making sure that I got those all at the, at the full diameter of the hole. And then I can countersink them. And with veneer, this is sort of doubly important that you do this because not only do you not want to create a volcano where that hole is, you don't want that volcano to start pulling on the veneer. So the screw ideally doesn't even thread into the veneer. It gets right into the MDF below it. And out of curiosity, I actually did stick a micrometer on this veneer and it adds about 25 thousandths thickness. So what that would dictate is that the countersink be just ever so slightly bigger. So there I've done that. And, and by the way, this is all done before I'm actually sanding the cabinet because let's say, for example, I don't do this and I use a power sander and I pull that veneer up, well, there's a really good possibility when I run sandpaper over it that I'll sand right through the veneer and I'll get into the paper, uh, which in this case, it, good possibility it'd be hidden, but I would not encourage risking in that way. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, by pre, Drilling, I shouldn't say pre-drilling, by screwing these in, I'm creating the threads that the screw needs to go in there. And if it generates any problems, I can address it at this point. Better now than when the cabinet's finished. And since I'm here, I'm gonna do these tweeter holes too. Provided I can use my drill here. Actually, that was the clutch on it. So sometimes, for whatever reason, the uh, screws go in a little harder. Another reason to pre drill them uh, when you're setting that tweeter, you want to get it snug on the cabinet, but you don't want to break the frame of it. So uh, a little finesse with your screw gun if you're using one or your screwdriver if you're using that is worthwhile. I think there's a real tendency in the world in general, but especially with drivers, to over tighten them. You want them snug, but you don't need to reef on them. It, it, just, it just makes for, uh, you're just risking, you know, cracking something or breaking an edge out or something like that. And the weak area of this is going to, these are actually really strong frames, but the weak area is going to be that little bit of material that's right on the edge. And uh, so there, that's all ready to stick a, a, a driver in. And we won't have to pay any more attention to that until we get to the assembly of the speaker. And that's presumably after it's finished. So again, I'm going to clear some stuff out and get ready to sand. And we'll cover that. First in hand sanding, then with power sanding, and I'm going to show you the dust collection system I use. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can do it with a, a, a shop vac, but I found a little, uh, in, in, in the dust collection system you saw on the CNC, that's going into what's called a cyclone, which separates the, the heavier particles from the uh, really fine ones and keeps filters from getting plugged up but we'll cover that a little bit later. So I'm gonna close down this segment, 
change things around a little bit, then I'll come right back. We are back in the saddle one more time to finish up the sanding on these. And I think after I do this, I'm going to do a little handheld stuff to show the, the dust collection I use with the pneumatic sander. And, uh, but the first thing we're gonna do, well, first thing we gotta do is, I gotta put on my magnifier so it helps me see what I'm doing here. And the, uh, the file work, I, this is probably a little bit outside of what most woodworking type of things are gonna show you, but uh, during my career as a cabinet maker, I did a lot of what's called refacing, which is re-veneering the exterior of a cabinet. And that's where I kind of tumbled onto the, this particular file as being a really useful tool for all kinds of woodworking, because that kind of finishing flush taking an edge of an ear and finishing it flush is something that's done a lot in refacing. And uh, so these are all trimmed with the router and you can feel that edge. And, and you probably want to feel that edge because you want it to be flush or a little proud if the router was cutting into, when you're cutting this surface and cutting that veneer, if it were cutting into that surface, there would be a problem. So uh, that's why, first of all, I recommend the router bits I do. And secondly, these cabinets, because they're really square, assuming something didn't happen along the way, the, they should come out with really square 90 degree edges here. So you don't have a lot of overhang or you don't have a situation where you're digging into the already veneered surfaces. Hope that all makes sense. So. When I look to file these, I, I get a feel for things, and that's literal. I do feel things to, to see what I'm up against. And when I'm filing, it, it probably isn't really apparent to the camera, but I am filing at an angle. What I want to do is have that come over and have that veneer actually drop off at a very slight angle. It's a degree or two. Now I've developed a feel for that and I can do it by hand. And you'll see that's exactly how I do it. I'm actually leaning that up a little bit. And what that prevents, especially if you're using a sanding block, you don't want to sand like that and have it splinter that veneer. So if that is beveled off a little bit, there's a lot less risk of doing that. And I think it's a worthwhile thing to do even if you're power sanding, uh, a, a, a sander like I showed earlier is what they call a dual action sander. So it's not only going in around in an orbit, it's, it's spinning around as well. I don't know how much sense that makes, but it's called a dual action sander. And this, it actually would work easier on something like this, but if you're hand sanding some things you gotta really pay attention to, you don't want to push off the edge like that because especially with splintery woods like oak, you'll, you'll break that and you'll get a divot on the surface that you really don't want. So that's what a, a file helps to do. The other thing you can do with a file, and I, I had a friend I used to work with and, and he would do this. You can take a piece of masking tape. If you're not confident that you're holding the file at an angle that works, you can just wrap a piece of masking tape around it. You know what, I'm gonna get some different masking tape. The adhesive on regular brown masking tape is a little greater. It makes it harder to get off, but we're not talking about leaving it on for days and weeks. So take a little bit of sandpaper and you're just putting it around, or sandpaper. Yeah, this is not sandpaper, this is masking tape and just wrap it around the file. And what that does is when you stroke the surface, it picks this end up a little bit, just like I do by my hand. And a couple of wraps is probably plenty good. The, the key to making this all work, and, and this applies to almost all forms of sanding, if you get cross grain scratches, if you get scratches going across the grain, sometimes they don't show up until you go to stain it. And 
then they're really hard to get out. So I take kind of great pains to not do that. Now, DA sanders will, because of the way they orbit, they don't leave much in the way of scratches that you can see. But things like sanding blocks and sanding pads, if I were to go like that, I would have a really difficult time trying to sand that out. And remember, we're only talking about a few mils thick here, so you can't just sand on it willy-nilly. So, put the tape on if you like the idea of that, and just stroke across this. And this is a lot by feel. Again, I, I use my fingernail to kind of drag across that and see if I'm getting this flush and the edge of that veneer you'd actually want it beveled off just a tiny amount. It's, it's something that's kind of hard to describe, but once you do it, I think you'll get it. And if you understand the reason why, then it, it, it all kind of makes sense. So I will file before I do anything else. And I might alternate between the, the, the heavy cut side on that file and the light cut. And you'll see the, the glue will fill that up, and that's where the file card comes in that I showed earlier. So the, the places that you're going to have veneer overhanging are all of the back. And ideally, the sequence I followed uh, is, is best because it puts the, the veneer edges in the least visible places. So you're going to have the top, because it was last, you're going to have a veneer seam all the way around the top. You're going to have it on all four sides in the back. Uh, but when you look at it from the front, the only, which is going to be the most visible area, the only two you're going to see are that. So there is a, there's a method to the madness in terms of sequence. And by the way, this is a brand new file. I thought I'm going to talk about people sharpening files. Maybe I should actually show a, a, uh, file at work and, and I'm not putting a lot of pressure on this and I'm watching there's a little bit of glue I, I'm sure the camera won't see this but when I put the glue on I got a little bit over the edge or it went underneath my masking tape and you can actually see when you are filing that away and you don't want to necessarily try and take it off but you can see because of the bevel that you're getting down flush and there may be some left on there but we'll take that off when, when we're actually sanding. Notice I say we when I'm the one here doing it, and hopefully you're one here watching, and maybe there's something you can take away from all that. So it doesn't take much, especially if the file's new and sharp. Um, and, and you can see I'm not actually touching that. I'm probably tipping that over a few degrees. But this way, if you went like that, you wouldn't scratch across the grain there. And a real easy telltale there is your fingernail. Just drag your fingernail across that edge. If, you, if it catches, you need to work on it a little bit more. And there's a lot of people that would do this with sandpaper. I, this, again, is a technique I picked up. And I, I've never seen a lot of guys use it. Um, but I think it's worthwhile, and it, it sort of saves uh, trying to get up to an edge with a sander and try and concentrate a lot of, of sanding action right there, which is what you want to do, but it, it's, it's a little hard to control. So again, I'm feeling that edge. You can sometimes see the glue sort of roll up and you'll see it on my file right there too. That's, that's glue that you see on there. And just so you know, the, uh, the way I'm doing this is, is the way I do it. Some of the things like this I'm sure aren't on a lot of people's radar and maybe don't even matter. But uh, 
I always looked at it. I had a boss tell me this one time. He says, well, I'd rather bring somebody back from being kind of overkill than trying to push someone who's uh, doing a poor job to do a better job. It's just his philosophy was that was a better place to start. One of my mentors over the years that I had a lot of respect for. So I got those edges done. I'll do the front here. The, the corner is a little bit delicate. That, that, that takes some finesse to sort of work around that. And that's where a file, and remember I talked about the hard pad on the sander. Well, this is about as hard as you can get. That's gonna be really flat. So you know that you're not gonna be rolling an edge that you don't intentionally wanna do. Wherever you put that file is how it's gonna cut. I view sanding a little bit different, I guess. I, I look at it more like really fine planing, I guess, because in most cases, you don't want to follow the surface, you wanna flatten the surface. And it might sound like a hair splitting, probably is, but I assume if you're watching this far, you're, you'd rather know the hair splitting technique than the any port in a storm technique. I don't know how the boating analogy applies to woodworking, but there it is, nonetheless. Again, my fingernail is telling me everything there. You also see me switch from fine side to coarse side on this file, uh, just, uh, just because I, I don't want to just hog away on that and find out I went too far. Veneer is kind of unforgiving in that regard. You go too far and it's over. It truly is over at that point. I mean, it, it's something that's really difficult to go back and fix. And here I've got a, a pretty big gob of glue right there. And actually you can see that stripe. That's where the bearing was riding on my flush trimmer. And when I start approaching that glue, what it'll do is it'll, it'll peel back from the edge. And it, it, so it's, it's visual. And there, I don't know if you noticed that, but that just pulled that glue right off all in kind of one fell swoop. You get to that point, stop. You don't want to go any further because the sanding will take care of whatever's left. And again, you can see I'm holding that up at a little bit steeper angle than the, the uh, this is sort of a safeguard. And, and to be honest, it's not one I use most of the time. I've, I've got developed a feel for this, but I wouldn't expect everybody to have that innately. I think some of the things that I'm talking about, like the pulling the glue off on those hunks like that, it's one of those deals that's really difficult to explain, but when you see it happening, it, it, will, it will be apparent. So always when, uh, I used to do a lot of uh, site work uh, for, so I was on job sites and I carried a tool bag around with me and I always had a file in my tool bag. It became a, a kind of a standard tool for me. So there we've got all of those flushed and you can feel them and I'm feeling one right there that either I didn't get or I didn't complete. So. You'll hear me harp on that idea of seeing with your hands a lot. It's, it's something that I do unconsciously now. 
Um, but your your hands are and and the, you know the the fingertips and stuff like that are really really sensitive to a lot of things. So. Uh, far more than I think our eyes can see. Now that might sound like kind of a weird concept, but it's certainly something I found to be true. So I'm going around feeling all that, and those all feel flush. So now on to sanding, and I'm going to sand half of this cabinet with a sanding block. This is 150 grit. For most veneer, that's probably a good place to start. You start much less than that. If you had really rough veneer or you're trying to take out some hairiness of that grain, maybe deeper or a, a greater, a, what I should say, a coarser grit than that. Uh, but 150 is probably where you want to go. And it, really you could end up there. And you want to be kind of cautious. So you've got, over, you've got vertical edges coming up on this whole back. So it's a good place to kind of practice. When you're sanding, a, a sanding block is built like this for one reason. That's because when you use a hand sandpaper like that, you're naturally gonna go over the edge like this. And it really doesn't have that planing effect that a sanding block does. And because I beveled this edge, I'm not too concerned about rolling off like that and splintering that grain. and and Oak is generally really tough, but splintering is, is a possibility because of the openness of the grain. And hopefully I don't have to tell you this, but you always want to sand with the grain. The minute you start doing that, it will leave scratches that are really difficult to deal with later on. And another thing you can do with a hard block, like I'm using here, is you can, and this is not going to be noticeable. If you went and looked at furniture in a furniture store, you'd find that the edges are, they might look crisp on a table or any other kind of furniture, but they're really, they're usually what's called broken, which means that instead of a square edge like that, there's a little tiny radius right there. And you can do that with a sanding block like this. And that's at about a 45 degree angle. I might vary that a little bit. And all I'm looking to do is, is bevel that edge a tiny bit. It's not something you'd see. It's not like a, putting a bevel on with a router, but it takes away the sharpness. And uh, a, a crisp corner is rarely really sharp. So I'll often do that. And that sort of starts the process of breaking that edge. And typically what I'll do is sand the whole cabinet, then go around and break edges. And you can do it other ways too. You can do it with hand sandpaper. And I just kind of put my finger, I don't know how best to show that, my finger there and pull that paper. And I'm actually putting my fingertip right there. Now, the, the downside to this technique is that paper sort of wraps around. And when you get onto this, you are going across the grain. So you want to be sure that you're not lapping over and putting sanding scratches going this direction in grain that's going that direction. So again, it's the pinpoint of your finger just putting right on that corner. And it doesn't have to be a sawing motion. It can just be, you know, put the sandpaper on there, pull it across. Those speed in my experience when it comes to woodworking is, well, maybe it's necessary in, in industry, but uh, by and large, and, and you'll see me do this a couple different ways. I mean, I'm using different fingers and it's a little weird for me to talk about the things I'm doing because I've never really done it before. I mean, this is all giving instructions was something I would do occasionally to people I was working with, but uh, generally it wasn't so fine a detail. So that back is now sanded to 150 grit. If I wanted to take it, so 150 grit, I would say is probably the minimum you want to finish. And the, the maximum is probably 220. So this, uh, this paper is 220 and I need to grab a sanding block. I thought I brought one over here. 
Well, I'm going to use a, uh, a sanding sponge in lieu of it. And I'll, I'll look for the sanding block while I'm standing here. So these are, these were sanding sponges I got at Home Depot. So these are, should be easy to access and they're 180 grit. So here, and, and this, these techniques I'm showing on this one part of the cabinet, you can use all over the whole cabinet. The only thing that is really critical with sanding is never get sanding scratches. Cause if you stain this, it might not look like it, but when you stain it, it absolutely show up. And now these sanding blacks are pretty hard, so they have kind of the same planing effect as that. But what I would suggest is do the planing with the rough sandpaper, the rougher sandpaper, in this case 150, and then do the finished sanding with 180, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with 180 here. Back at it here, the battery in the camera died, so... I switched that and in the meantime I found my sanding block. This is a hard rubber sanding block. These are, these are a little hard to find. I get them from a company called Mohawk, but they are wholesale only. But I think some of these products are sold in home, uh, not home centers, but uh, places like Woodcraft. They seem to handle some of Mohawk's products. And it, you know, again, I'm stressing this is flat and it's hard. So that's not spongy at all. So you can use that in the same way that you use the, uh, the uh, rougher sandpaper there and then finish up with the, the uh, finer grits either in a sanding sponge like this or with a sanding block and that just has sandpaper. That's a quarter of a sheet of sandpaper and now you just wrap it around like that. And so finish the back and now I'll move on to the bottom. It doesn't really matter the sequence you do this in, I suppose, but uh, I guess I look at the bottom as being the least important surface. So the least visible probably. So now this doesn't have any edges on it. So this is really easy. And if you feel that before you start and then after, well, again, I, I look at this more like it's planing wood than it is sanding. And in the, in the commercial woodworking world, there's a lot of things that want to flatten the surface. And, and there's good reason to. That's how you get those really beautiful finishes that look like glass because the surface doesn't undulate. And that's partly accomplished at this stage, and, and, but primarily it, that dead flat finish is going to be a result of the finish itself. And, and you can't spray, well, I shouldn't say you can't. The, the way to get that glassy finish is actually probably not a result of the product you use or the way you apply it. It's doing what's called finishing the finish, which means that you sand that finish in the, in the automotive world, they call that cut and buff, which is cutting means that they're actually abrading the surface of the clear coat with really fine abrasive that goes up to a thousand grit or 1500 grit or 2000 grit, even higher than that in some cases with really nice finishes like on show cars and stuff like that. And then they polish it back. So they, they spray it, which always leaves a little bit of orange peel. Then they cut it back to take away all the orange peel. Then they polish it to a really high sheen. It can leave a really beautiful finish, but it's also really intensive in terms of time spent doing it. Uh, so it's, you think, oh, when they spray a car like that, they just spray it and they're done. And that's not the case. In fact, there's shows on TV where they show that now. It used to be kind of a, only the people doing it really knew that that was happening, but more common knowledge now. So again, me and my feeling stuff, I'm feeling as I go here, and there's a little rough patch right there, which sometimes happened with veneer, and so I, adjacent to that, it's nice and flat, but I really need to work that whole surface down and get that one area. This is where power sanding really makes things go faster. When I'm doing it by hand, Sandpaper gets the actual dust underneath it and it, it prevents you from getting down, from working the surface down very quickly. But 
I guess I'm of the mind that patience is a virtue and if you slow down, you'll get there in a way that is better in the end game. And I guess I apply that philosophy kind of not randomly, but some things need to go fast, some things need to go slow. And finishing to me is, is one of those things that probably is best slow down a little bit. And I consider the sanding part of the finishing. So um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you one other thing here, and then I'm gonna switch over to the uh, DA sander, and, and I, I think if, if, if you own a DA sander, you probably already are going to know and have a feel for what it does, but the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of cover it anyway, because you know how thorough I am. i got to cover all the bases, right? Um, on the tweeter hole, that's an edge you also want to break. So again, the breaking of the edge is just a really small radius, not one that's noticeable to the eye, but you can feel it. A sharp edge is just that, it's sharp. A broken edge has a really tiny radius, probably only the thickness of the veneer. So you're talking about a radius of um, maybe a 64th of an inch and here again, you want to steer clear of trying to sand it like that because you'll get sanding scratches, cross grain scratches in there that will show up later. Trust me on this. Anybody who's watching this who's done that can vouch for that effect. So to, in order to do that, again, I'll use uh, kind of the fine point of my finger and put it right on the corner. And just work my around, but I'm careful not to jump up onto the edge and go across the grain. So really, I'm only working in a on a the point of that uh, where those two uh, the this edge and this edge meet. I'm just looking to get on the point of that. You can break edges after you sand. I found in many cases with veneer, it's actually easier to do it beforehand. And that way, if you do happen to get sanding scratches, there's a good possibility. And I just did something that I just would, and that's why, because <laughs> you can't see that in the camera, but I kind of went out like that with my sandpaper and I can see scratches in there. And if I don't take them out, they will show up. Now in this case, they won't because the, that is gonna be covered the driver is going to cover that. So here I am giving advice and then telling you that it's not valid, but uh, patience pays off right here. So I'm looking to just make sure that when I run my finger across the face of that router, I don't hit in a, or, uh, that router, the, the tweeter, that I don't feel an abrupt edge there. I, I, acoustically, that's a good thing, but also it has to do with eyeball. So what looks like square edges on furniture, if you, if you use your, the best tool you have to, to gauge that and run your finger out, you'll find that there are very few really sharp edges in, in furniture. So I'm gonna uh, bag this at this point, not bag it, but I'm gonna stop this at this point and kind of set up with my uh, uh, pneumatic sander, do the rest of the cabinet, and then We'll call it a day. Why does that sound? We're on the home stretch. So what I've done is set up that uh, deal you saw before. And so I've got a pneumatic sander here. And this shows you again, the, the sandpaper. And it really the sandpaper is sort of a misnomer because it's, it's mesh and by being mesh, I don't have to be concerned at all uh, about where I put that on the uh, sanding pad because wherever it is, those holes that you saw in the surface will line up. And this is a little bit newer sander than the one I showed you earlier. It's got more holes in it. Again, a, a Dyna braid. And there are probably other sanders out there will do the same work, but this is gonna be noisy. Um, it's gonna, I'm gonna have the vacuum running, which by the way, uh, if, if you're doing this a lot, this might be of interest. This is a deal called a, it's called a long ranger. And what it does is it gives me a switchable outlet, a wirelessly switchable outlet, which I have that 
cyclone plugged into. So when I'm doing this, I can turn it on and off without having to actually go to the machine. <laughs> kind of a nice convenience. And uh, anyway, so I just hang that on my belt. So you'll see me reach down, turn it on and off. And I'll probably, when I edit this, I'll, I'll probably blast through this pretty fast because honestly, it's a little like watching paint dry, watching somebody sand. But so I, I'm going to do the face. I, I, before I did the, I think I did the back and I did the bottom. So I got the face, the top, and, and one side to do. And I'll do that and uh, maybe stop in between a little bit. And, but I'll, I'll uh, because it's noisy and I can't talk over it, I'll just, uh, I'll probably fast forward through it. Okay, so here we go. The reason you saw me go back over this one area right here, when I was gluing this up and I remembered because I could see it, I had that taped up or when I was putting the veneer on and I slopped a little glue over and I actually wiped it off, but I could see the edge of that where it went past the tape. So I was working on that area just a little bit more to make sure I had that glue off of there. It, this is the one case where I say if you get glue on, you want to get it off right away because if it sinks into the grain on uh, especially oak, it's, it's going to be there pretty permanently. You cannot dig down into that grain and get stuff out. It's just way too open and gets down below the surface to the point where it's just hard to get at. So I'm going to continue on this side, which is almost done, and uh, then do this other side and the top. So there I am, seeing with my hands again. Um, and one more surface, and then, uh, then the, the, you'll notice I haven't done anything. I've just, I've been sanding on these surfaces, which means that I haven't sanded the edge. Now there are two ways that can be done. If you're feeling comfortable, you can roll a sander around like that. Uh, if not, you can do it with a sanding sponge. So I'm gonna do this top, and then I'll, I think the sanding sponge is a safe way to go about that. And uh, if you were to see me on any given day in the shop, you might see me roll around that edge. But again, I'm, it, it's, it's something that you can get out of control pretty fast. And not to say that you're not capable, but um, I guess I look at it as being kind of a better safe than sorry situation. So more noise and then we'll cover that. One other thing I should probably talk about, I don't know if you can hear, my compressor's running in the background. The thing uses a lot of air, by the way. You need a big compressor to run it. Um, and that is, you probably saw me, you know, coming up to this edge. And uh, you know, there's another thing I might cover there. You don't want to start the sander like this and then drop it on the surface. That'll definitely give you some, some disc-shaped scratches. So put it on the surface, then start. Uh, so a little word to the wise there, because I've screwed up many things doing that. Um, but you'll notice that I didn't go over this edge a whole bunch. I'm, I'm going over about an inch, maybe a third of the pad. And the potential exists, if you get over the edge here, you roll that, and it'll, at the very least, it'll, it'll give you an edge that's inconsistent. And on, on edges like that, I like to have them real crisp. 
Um, I do break them, but veneer, because it's, it's so thin, you can easily sand through the veneer if you do that. And, and it, that's an un, oh, I shouldn't say it's unrepairable, but it, it's difficult to repair. So anyway, we'll move on here. And again, I'm that 180 sponge. Now that, this is where a sponge really works nice because you can push some pressure on it and roll right around there. And I don't know how evident that is from the camera's angle, but I'm putting about that much pressure. So I'm, I'm covering more distance than it would if it were just a flat pad, but I'm not trying to get it all in one fell swoop. I'm, I'm working my way around that three or four times. And you know, once again, fingers tell the story. Okay, that feels good to me. And uh, so the other cabinet is done. And there we have a pair of cabinets and they're ready to finish at this point. The one thing I might do is make sure that I've broken all the edges that I want to. And that's, again, you see me doing this all the time. Uh, I'll feel things and uh, with my fingers to make sure that I've gotten it. a real easy thing to do. Uh, I find it easier than and visually. So those are ready to finish and uh, I'll be finishing these. I, I've got an idea for a finish uh, which I, I think will work. If it's a bomb I guess you get to watch me bomb but um, that's it for now. So uh, folks I, I, I know I, that these videos are long and I, it's partly because of me and partly because I want to be thorough but uh, I appreciate you watching if you got this far. And uh, I, I hope that uh, you're taking something away from it because uh, I'm, I'm not really looking. My, my whole aim here is to help people in, in their endeavors, not to become a YouTube celebrity because in all honesty, it doesn't matter much to me. But uh, uh, so anyway, that's it for now. And uh, next go, you'll see these transform into something a little different. It is winter here in Idaho and there's snow on the ground and you can't see it. But um, So finishing, because I don't have a spray booth, is a little iffy this time of year, so it may be a little bit of a stretch, but we'll get there. And uh, come summertime, a little bit warmer weather, I can spray outside and bring inside to dry, which speeds things up. Well, makes it possible. I, I, I really can't spray when it's snowing outside and uh, Spray booth would be a nice thing, but, and, and by the way, you're going to watch me spray, but at this stage of the game, you could finish these nicely with, with hand applied finishes. Those are slow because you have to do them by hand and the coats take a long time to build up, but you can certainly get a nice finish that way. And I've done myself some furniture that way. The, the big thing is time. You just can't rush finishes like that. You need to wipe them on, wipe most of it off, let it dry, come back a day or two, do the whole thing over. Uh, it's a whole thing about washing your hair, you wash, rinse, repeat. Well that happens a lot in wood finishing if you want to get to the kind of finish that feels really nice to your hand. I mean when I run my hand across this right now, this raw wood, it feels really smooth, that 180 grit. and you can get that and better with hand applied finishes, but it just is protracted over many, many coats and a lot of time. So I guess I'd look at it like this. You don't want to get to this point doing these beautiful cabinets and then cheap out or try and speed up on the, the final leg of the, of the journey. So that's kind of Peter's philosophy anyway. You can adopt it or not. But uh, I, again, uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next go. And time for me to go edit out all, well, probably not all, but some of the stuff that you don't care to see. So see you again. Bye.